Hello, Mark here. Before we begin today's episode, I would just like to quickly take the time to ask all of those who are enjoying the series a favour. If the platform you use to listen to Castings for Ancient Greece has a rating or review system, I would be extremely grateful if you would consider leaving the series a quick review. These ratings and reviews go a long way into helping others discover the show, in turn helping it grow. So if you enjoy the series and can spare a few minutes, I would love to read what you have to say about your experiences with the show. Thanks everyone for your support, and let's get to today's episode. I have many other reasons to hope for a favourable outcome, if you can consent not to combine schemes of fresh conquest with the conduct of war, and will abstain from willfully involving yourselves in other dangers. Thucydides Hello, I'm Mark Selleck and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece, Episode 67, The Athenian Empire. So we are now back to our narrative after having spent the last few episodes looking at the development of the polis of Corinth, then looking at the mystery behind locating the island of Ithaca from the Odyssey with Professor James Diggle. I hope you enjoyed what Professor Diggle had to present, and it will be interesting to see what develops as the year goes on. Like I said, we took some time out in the narrative to look back at Corinth and its development up to where we are now in the series. I hope this has given a bit more context to the polis, and will let us move forward with a better understanding of how the city developed. Like I have said in the past, I decided to take the time out and give Corinth the same treatment I had done for other city-states, due to Corinth now starting to appear more frequently and playing an important role in how Greek diplomacy would unfold as we move closer to the Peloponnesian War. We will do something similar with other places such as Thebes when the time seems right. Now to set the picture of where we are now in the series. We have just come out of the Samian War that had developed. We had seen this resulted due to war breaking out between two members within the Dillian League, that of Samos and Miletus. Athens was not standby idle and would intervene on the side of Miletus. This would see Samos look to revolt from Athens, with them attempting to seek aid from both Sparta and Persia. After some Athenian setbacks and around two years of conflict, Samos would finally be brought back into the league. We had seen that Sparta and Persia had decided to sit on the sidelines, where Sparta had debated if they should get involved within the Peloponnesian League, and Persia was perhaps looking to see if Sparta would act. Though in the end, no help would arrive for Samos, and Athens would once again put out another fire within the Aegean. This had seen that the Thirty Years' Peace would hold for the time being. However, it also highlighted that Athens still did have an issue with its members on occasion. This instance was a little different than what had been occurring before, as Samos did not look to revolt from the start, but had when they saw Athens acted against them in their war with another member. We also see the terms after Samos was brought under control were pretty lenient, indicating the circumstances were perhaps a bit different than the past revolts Athens had dealt with. Though it cannot be overlooked that other places during the lead up to the Samian War had been apparently revolting. We don't get any accounts of these revolts in the historical record, but we do get indications that they were taking place, due to the disappearance of certain cities from the tribute lists and then their reappearance a year or two later. So coming out of this war with Samos, Athens was still looking to shore up its position and control within the Aegean, while there was also the matter of further developing and strengthening its sphere of influence in the face of the powers of Sparta and Persia. If Athens found itself in a weakened state within its own sphere, the Thirty Years' Peace and the Peace of Callias would be of no point to Athens' opponents. So, for this episode, we'll be looking at developments taking place within Greece and the Aegean from 439 BC. This will see us looking at Athens taking measures to secure itself within its own sphere and against its rivals. Though perhaps to start with, let's turn to the notion of what Athens' sphere was now. We had seen it began as a league under the Delian League, but we've also started calling it an empire, using these terms interchangeably. But now moving forward, perhaps we can drop the league aspect and continue with the fact that Athens was now overseeing an empire. When the Delian League first emerged, it was due to the realities the various Greek cities and islands now found themselves in after the defeat of the Persian invasions. The Hellenic League had been created in response to the Persian threat. This league included another league, the Peloponnesian League. The Peloponnesian League had Sparta at its head and looked to preserve the interests within the Peloponnese. However, with the looming threat of the Persian invasion, others outside of the Peloponnesian League were looking to join in a common defence of Greece. Athens was the largest of these outsiders, 
with them and others not sharing the common interests of the Peloponnesians. However, what they did share was a common desire to defend their lands from the Persian invasion, which would see the Hellenic League created. Though, after 479 and the victories at Plataea and Mycale, the reason for the various groups coming together had become less of a threat. From the perspective of the Peloponnesians, Greek lands had been saved and the threat had been pushed back. All through the Persian invasions, we would see them wanting to revert to their Peloponnesian-centric view. Now with the Persians pushed back across the Aegean and in Anatolian lands, they would become more hesitant at continuing operations. Especially for Sparta, they were not very partial to the idea of having large parts of their military far away from their own lands. We saw this highlighted when Aristagoras came seeking their aid before the Ionian Revolt. Cleomenes, once learning that it would be a three-month journey just to make it to Sardis, sent Aristagoras packing. On the other side of the coin, Athens was in a position where continued operations in the Aegean and along the Anatolian coast were very much in their interest. Athens' trade networks ran through the Black Sea, while networks were also in place along the Anatolian coast to a number of Greek cities. With the Persian defeat, these connections to Ionia only strengthened, though this also saw Persia as a continued threat to these networks that Athens held far away from their city. What's more is that with the liberation of many of these eastern Greek cities, Athens now found themselves in a position where they held common interests with another large group of Greek cities, replacing those of the Peloponnesians. These Eastern Greeks would raise Athens to a position with far more influence than they previously held within the Hellenic League. Sparta had had most of the support on their side, but now the scales were shifting. What would take place was not the reshaping of the Hellenic League, but since the interests were so different to the Peloponnesians, a new league would end up being formed. However, the Hellenic League still remained intact, but it appears it would now take a back seat to the Peloponnesian League and what was now forming in the Aegean. We saw that Athens, along with a number of Eastern Greek cities and islands, would come together on the island of Delos to form what we now call today the Delian League. The main focus of the League was to protect the Greeks against further Persian aggression and look after their interests in the Aegean. In the initial stages of the League, a system was set up to seem as though all were equal members within the League. They would all swear an oath that they would all have the same friends and enemies, unlike with the Peloponnesian League where the only constant was that its members had to have an alliance with just Sparta. When it came to voting within the League on matters, all would receive one vote to cast as they saw fit, no matter the size or influence of the member. All members would also have the responsibility in seeing that the League was maintained. This would be through a type of tribute or tax system. This would be judged on the size and wealth of each member, with each member city and island deciding whether to provide men for campaigning, ships or money to help fund the operations. Finally, the treasury would be set up on the island of Delos, somewhat of a midway point between the Greek mainland and the eastern Greek cities. Perhaps the main point with this arrangement was to highlight that Athens did not own the treasury. All these measures were to give the impression that all members had an equal and fair share within the League. Though we have previously in the series pointed out that some of these were perhaps more for window dressing. For example, although each member had one vote, Many of the smaller cities and islands were heavily influenced by Athens. We can see early on that they held a great amount of influence with many of the Eastern Greeks, when it was these smaller members that lobbied for Athens to take a leading role in the Hellenic League, just before the creation of the Delian League. Also, it was Aristides of Athens that we hear is arranging the tribute levels that each member was to pay, not a collective board that would perhaps lead to a fairer level to be paid by all. Anyway, these were the measures put in place to help administer and support this new Delian League. On the face of it, it was supposed to be a league that all provided to and had an equal say in its dealings. However, as we saw, it would be in its actions that would show who was really calling the shots. And as we will see, it wouldn't be too long until some of the measures in place to give this impression of equality were dispensed with. To begin with, the actions undertaken by the Delian League were to fit the mandate they had set out with in protecting the Aegean from a Persian threat. Though it wasn't long until the view of what constituted a Persian threat was extended and applied to situations not directly connected to Persia. This had seen Greek cities becoming the target of the Delian League activities due to them interfering with the League trade routes or being identified as strategically vulnerable locations. This view of what was seen as a threat against the League security then expanded when members of the League looked to leave. The strength of the League lay with the unity of the members and the tribute they provided. If members were allowed to leave when they deemed the Persian threat to themselves as low, then there would be a constant flow of members coming and going 
as the situation in the Aegean changed. This would see that the League would have far less power in the Aegean and unable to respond effectively to threats as they developed. In turn, this would see Athens being burdened with maintaining security in the Aegean themselves for the most part. With the continued revolts within the Delian League, it appears this is how Athens viewed the situation they were faced with. They would begin to remove much of the manpower burden of other members towards the League's campaigns. However, they would impose forced tribute on these cities and islands, while taking most of the manpower and material burden themselves. This would see much of the direct involvement by other members being removed, with them in effect paying for protection. We then find Athens responding to the developments of the League by attempting to take more control over the treasury maintaining the League and forcing members into honouring their responsibilities to its upkeep. In the evolution of the Delian League, over the decades, there were probably two main activities undertaken by Athens that would see the League morph into an Athenian Empire. This first was a single decision and action, while the other was a collection of measures implemented over time as more members looked to leave. This single decision would be in the 450s when the League's treasury was moved from the island of Delos to Athens. The reason given for this move was to keep the treasury safe from Persian activities, who, Athens would have argued, had been more active in recent times, with the battles of the Eurymedon only taking place a few years earlier, and Persian activities around Cyprus. However, with more and more members attempting to leave and discontent detected throughout the Aegean, it would seem it would be in Athens' interest to move the treasury somewhere where they could control its security more effectively. It's also after this move that we would start to see Athens use some money from the treasury for their own purposes, not just for the upkeep of the Delian League. Studying history, we like clean lines of distinction, and many see this point as being where the League moved from being an alliance to an empire. Though as we know, history is usually not so cut and dry. In hindsight, this may give this appearance, but after this point, there were other measures also taking place that would see Athens gain a tighter control over the League. As more revolts had been taking place, we would start to see Athens implement a system to attempt to control various members. These were through measures known as Clutches and Proxenoi. A Clutchy was a former colony that was tied to Athens and would usually be made up of armed men. We would find as important cities tried to break away or were at risk of doing so, Athens would set up a Clutchy within their territory. In a way, this was a threat of force if the city or island looked to act in a way not aligned to Athenian interests. Also added to this system of colonies was that of the Proxenoi, an official from Athens that would be assigned a region where they would maintain contact with the different member cities. This was supposedly to maintain frequent contact with Athens and to foster good relations. However, it would also be a way for Athens to detect the feelings of the different cities as these officials would have an understanding of the region's city's political landscape. So it would appear the Delian League by this stage had now transitioned into an Athenian Empire. These cities and islands that had made up the Delian League no longer had much of a say in the operations of the League. Athens had seen that they now took on the responsibility, with them having to contribute most of the manpower and material. Most members were now relegated to just providing funds to go towards the operational costs. Further to this, the members were not in a position to leave the League if they chose to. If they attempted, force would be used to ensure they would remain as a tribute paying member. Controlling mechanisms were also implemented on many occasions to ensure continued payment to the burdens Athens faced. If we look at a common definition for empire, we could perhaps argue Athens now fitted this bill. An extensive group of states or countries ruled over by a single monarch, an oligarchy or a sovereign state. So now that we have looked at the transition from league to empire, let's now get back to the current situation in the Aegean and beyond for Athens. We have seen so far that many of the revolts that had taken place were within the Aegean region, and Athens had been able to respond effectively to them, mainly through force. However, there were further flung regions that were also providing headaches for Athens. They would all provide their own challenges and would see Athens having to respond differently to each as their role and situation in the bigger picture pose different risks and benefits. So let's have a look at each in their own right. The first region would be one that bordered where Athens had been intervening in troubles before. Caria was also in the region of Anatolia and south of Ionia. Many of the Greek cities in this region had also been disappearing and reappearing on tribute lists. However, the effort required to policing these cities was immense, as many of them were situated some distance inland from the coast. This would see that they would have better trade connections east with Persia, while also having a constant daily connection to Persian culture. Many of the cities 
would have fallen within Persian territory and would have been difficult for Athens to remain control of. The only way they could have expected to do this would be by having a large military presence within the region. Though given the size of Caria and their opponent Persia, this would have been a severe drain on resources. Given these conditions, it would not have been that these cities were looking to rebel from Athens, but more of a fact that their interests were more closely tied with that of Persia. As we know, Persia exacted tribute on the cities in Anatolia, but these cities would also pay a similar tribute had Athens been able to exert influence into the region. However, by the 430s, Athens had recognised that the benefit that these cities provided to them did not match the effort required to maintain them as members. What would take place was that some 40 cities within Caria would be permanently removed from the Athenian tribute list, while the region of Caria would be incorporated into Ionia, seeing those coastal cities of Caria still under Athenian influence being accounted for under Ionia on the tribute list moving forward. Have you been enjoying the series and thinking of helping support the show in some way? Casting Through Ancient Greece is over on Patreon, where we have been providing supporters with monthly bonus episodes, where we look at past topics in more detail and isolation. So far we have revisited the Bronze Age of Greece, looking at art, trade connections, warfare, and a number of other topics. We then advanced into the Archaic Period, where we then spent some time exploring the little-known Latitine War, the Olympic Games, and emergence of the Hoplite, and other areas. This then saw us turn to doing a three-part series on the epic poet Homer, where we also explored the two epic poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey, that are credited to him. Currently we are exploring the developments of both Sparta and Athens in more detail. We have recently dealt with the origin myths of both Sparta and Athens, as well as looking at some of their early influential figures coming from both cities. Currently we are exploring the institutions that would develop in both of these cities, with us having focused on the Spartan Agoge and Helot system, while in Athens we are looking at their political reforms through the restructure of tribes and the political mechanism of the ostracism. If you are interested in gaining access to these bonus episodes, please consider heading over to the Casting Through Ancient Greece Patreon page. Not only will you get monthly bonus episodes, but you will receive early access, ad-free episodes, plus video series updates about what's been happening in the series and what is planned. Other options also include access to fully referenced transcripts of the series episodes, where members' questions are answered monthly via video. Alternatively, you can head to the Casting Through Ancient Greece website, where you can find the Patreon link, as well as other ways that help the series grow when clicking on the Support the Series button. Thank you for listening to the series, and I look forward to perhaps seeing you over on Patreon. As we have spoken about a number of times, the sea route travelling from Athens through to the Black Sea was vitally important for Athens. More than ever, they needed to maintain a steady supply of grain that would originate in the Ukraine. One vital city that Athens needed to influence was that of Byzantium, that lay at the Bosphorus, the narrow strait leading to the Black Sea. We had seen that after the Greeks' victory over Persia, this city would now be open to Greek influence coming back in. However, as we saw, there was still some competition over this vital city, with this region being close within Persian controlled areas. The episode around Pausanias going rogue and attempting to establish himself as some sort of tyrant in the city highlighted the competing interests of both the Greeks and the Persians. Though after the Delian League had come into existence, Greek influence was able to be extended more effectively into the region, which would see Byzantium become a member within the League itself. It would be around the events of the Samian War that we have covered where we would find Byzantium also revolting from Athens. This now highlighted a vulnerability in Athens' food supply, as it was imperative that they held influence in the region to ensure that they would receive a steady flow of grain coming out of the Black Sea. Fortunately for Athens, once the Samian War had been won and Samos brought back into the empire, Byzantium would also follow suit. Still, this was an issue that required attention. Unlike the region of Caria, this was of vital importance to Athens and its continued growth. For this reason, we would end up seeing a delegation making its way to the Black Sea from Athens, headed by Pericles. I just want to pause here for a minute to really highlight the importance of Byzantium and the route to the Black Sea for Athens. This was not just important to Athens for economic reasons, but it was at the centre of Athens' defensive strategy. We have spoken about the long walls that had been constructed from Athens to the Piraeus. This would provide protection from land attacks into Attica with obviously the land power of Sparta providing the motivation for this building project. Well, the other part of this defensive plan saw that the navy would be able to keep the city fed while under siege, with Athens in theory being able to outlast their attackers. To keep the city fed, 
it would be the route to the Black Sea that the Athenians would be travelling to and from. So, if there were a disruption to this link, it would undermine Athens' entire defensive strategy on the mainland. Anyway, back to Athens' response in the situation around Byzantium. The war with Samos had come to an end around 439 BC, with Byzantium also coming back over to Athens. In the years following, Pericles arranged for an effort to see that Byzantium would remain in Athens' sphere of influence, reducing the risk of a repeated revolt. I'll read from Plutarch's Life of Pericles of the expedition that is thought to have taken place around 437 or 436 BC. He also sailed into the Euxine Sea with a large and splendidly equipped armament. There he effected what the Greek cities desired and dealt with them humanely, while to the neighbouring nations of the barbarians with their kings and dynasts he displayed the magnitude of his force and the fearless in his courage which they sailed with soever they pleased, and brought the whole sea under their own control. He also left the banished Sinopians thirteen ships of war and soldiers under the command of Lamarcus to aid them. When the tyrant and his adherents had been driven from the city, Pericles got a bill passed, providing that six hundred volunteers of the Athenians should sail to Sinope, and settle down there with the Sinopians, dividing up among themselves the houses and lands which the tyrants and his followers had formerly occupied. So it appears Pericles had the intention of going all out with his expedition. On the one hand, it was his aim to impress the Greeks in the region and quell any misgivings that they might have in aligning themselves with Athens, being so far away. On the other hand, they also looked to intimidate those outside of Athens' influence, but nearby the regions that were so vitally important. We even find in the example of Sinope, located on the southern coast of the Black Sea, that he was lending aid to those who were under repressive regimes freeing the people of Sinope of their tyrant. Athenian colonists were also settled in the region to assist in the transition from tyranny, while also providing some security. This no doubt was also to assist in Athens retaining control in the region. We also hear of further colonies being established during this expedition east of Byzantium. These would have helped secure Athenian influence right up to the coast of the Black Sea, where the grain and other goods would depart for their long journey to Athens. The result of Pericles' expedition would see that Athens' food supply from the Black Sea ports, through the Bosporus, past Byzantium, and out through the Hellespont into the Aegean, would be the most secure it had been since relying on this trade route. However, there was still another large region that required Athenian attention. This was Thrace, stretching westward from Byzantium to where it would transition into Macedonian lands, then coming to the northern borders of Thessaly. The lands of Thrace and Macedon included some cities that had been part of the Delian League. However, the borders within these regions were not hard and fast. They could fluctuate with the situation. This would see times where Thracian and Macedonian influence would come to affect some of these League members. It would be during the Samian Revolt where it appears a number of these cities would also stop paying tribute and perhaps align more with the regional powers as Athens' attention was fixed elsewhere. However, with the resolution of the revolts of Samos and Byzantium, Athens was now in a position to iron out problems in other areas. For the most part, the cities that had been part of the Delian League were along the Macedonian or Thracian coasts. We had seen in the episodes we did on both Thrace and Macedon that these were the regions that were susceptible to influence from larger sea powers. Now it was Athens who held a dominant role along these coasts. However, when the manpower was lacking, it was difficult to prevent influence from further inland coming to interfere in politics of these cities. With the revolts east taken care of, Pericles now looked to stabilise these regions. This would be no easy task, as Athens' navy was not going to help much in this task. One of Athens' main strengths, since both Thrace and Macedon were continental powers. We had seen back around 465, Athens had attempted to establish a colony along the Strymon River, but were unable to hold their position there in the face of hostile tribes of the region. Since then, both Macedon and Thrace had only become more formidable opponents. Over the years, powerful clans and families had been attempting to unite the various regions within their lands. In Thrace, they were fast approaching what would be their most powerful period in history with the establishment of the Idrissian Kingdom that would control all the tribal groups. Now that Samos and Byzantium were back under control, Pericles now turned to arranging a campaign that would focus on making Athenian influence more permanent and secure in these coastal regions. This campaign seems to have first begun in 438 BC with the establishment of a colony at the site of Bria, this being just west of the Chalcidides, near the Thermaic Gulf coast. 
This first step was closed to other Athenian interests, allowing the site to be supported by sea and overland if needed. The next step was the establishment of the colony that the Greeks would name Amphipolis, this time east of the Chalcidides on the Strymon River. We have seen in the series that colonies at this site had been attempted before. In 497, Aristagoras, during the Ionian Revolt, had attempted, but failed. The second was the attempt we just brought up before, with Athens' initial failed attempt on the Strymon in 465. When looking at the location of these colonies, it seems that Pericles had the intention of guarding the entry of the Chalcidides from the inland. The location of these colonies would also allow for much easier support from the sea to filter into the region, while also allowing for Athens to respond more quickly to any cities in the region that may revolt, without having to wait for a campaign to be launched from Athens. It is worth noting that the establishment date of Bria is not 100%, but what we know of it comes from an inscription known as the Bria Decree. I want to follow Donald Kagan's example here and read out what the decree says, as it would be our most complete picture of Athens establishing a colony for imperial purposes, and may serve as an example in general to how other colonies were established. I will use the same translation Kagan uses, who he has borrowed from A.J. Graham. It must be noted that there are some damaged areas, so some sentences are incomplete. The adjutants of the Oikos shall make provision for the sacrifice, in order to obtain favourable omens for the colony, as they shall decide. Ten distributors of land shall be chosen, one from each tribe. These shall allot the land. Democlides shall establish the colony with full powers to the best of his ability. The sacred precincts that have been set up apart are to be left as they are, but no further precincts are to be consecrated. The colony is to make an offering of a cow and panoply to the great Panathenia, and a phallus to Dionysia. If anyone attacks the territory of the colonists, the cities are to bring help as quickly as possible according to the treaty which was made, when was first secretary of the council, concerning the cities of the Thracewood region. This decree is to be written on a stele and placed on the Acropolis. The colonists are to provide the stele at their own cost. If anyone puts a motion to the vote contrary to the stele, or speaks against it as a public orator, or attempts to persuade others to rescind or annul in any way the provisions decreed, he shall be deprived of civil rights together with his sons and his property shall be confiscated, and a one-tenth should go to the goddess, unless the colonists themselves make some request on their own behalf. Those in the army who are enrolled as additional colonists shall settle at Bria within 30 days of their arrival in Athens. The colonial expedition is to set off within 30 days, and the Achaeans shall accompany it and pay their expenses. Both Bria and Amphipolis were far away from Athens and on the edges of what many considered the civilised world. So Pericles had to make heading to be involved in the establishment of these colonies an attractive proposition. In most other cases, colonists would be required to pay for their own costs in travelling and establishing themselves, though it appears in both cases Athens was willing to foot the bill to attract recruits. We also hear in the case of Bria that men who had previously served in operations in Thracian lands were allowed to join the colony late, but still gain the same benefits of those initially setting out. Obviously, it would be of great value to have those who had been veterans in the region. While we would find in the case of Amphipolis, the colony was never required to pay tribute. Bria, on the other hand, we don't know about, but the colony, it seems, would not exist as its own settlement for too long, as it seems it might have been incorporated into the Athenian colony at Potidaea, perhaps around 429 BC, which would become the main Athenian base in the region. The establishment of Bria and Amphipolis, along with the actions in Anatolia and Byzantium, had not extended Athenian influence territorially, as Athens since the end of the Persian Wars had extended and had tried to maintain control in most of these areas. We had seen that over the decades that they had their work cut out for them, dealing with the outside forces such as Persia and Sparta, as well as those within the league system, with the many revolts taking place. We also found that Athens would overextend itself at times, which would threaten what they had already achieved, especially in the case of the campaign to Egypt. However, what had been achieved in the 430s with Pericles' policy was seeing that the edges of the Athenian Empire had been secured to a far greater extent than the previous 50 years. We saw in Anatolia a risk versus reward analysis was done, which would see much of the inland areas of Caria 
would be cut loose from the imperial apparatus, while the remainder would be streamlined from an administrative purpose, by including it in the region of Ionia. The western boundary was now much more manageable in dealing with, whether from the threat of Persian interference or internal rebellion. Seeing that the cities they did control were along the coast, saw that Athens' navy would have a much larger role to play if Persia were to venture to the coast like what took place at the Eurymedon. While the systems of regional garrisons and proxenoi would see that revolts would break out less or early intervention would be possible. Byzantium had been contested over the past decades with varying levels of Athenian and Persian influence shifting in the city. This is one place Pericles made a large push, indicating the importance of the city's strategic position. As we have said already, it was not so much as a matter of economic interests, but Athens' strategic position rested on the trade route that flowed into the Black Sea. This would see a large show of goodwill towards those Athens was looking to be integral in seeing Athens' interests would be maintained here. While the campaign also displayed a show of force to those regions dotted nearby that were hostile or could be persuaded to be hostile to Athens. Adding to this, the establishment of colonies into the Black Sea would see that trade routes originating on the shores of the Black Sea would be as secure as they had ever been. While in Thracian and Macedonian territories, Athens had been in a precarious existence through most of the 400s. We had seen when they would attempt to venture too far inland, their efforts at establishing colonies would be foiled by hostile tribes. We also get indications that Athenian resources were being drained here over the decades, with the Athenian tribute lists highlighting some cities revolting at various times. While surviving lists of Athenian war dead also show Athenian manpower was being deployed in the region to help deal with incursions of Thracians and Macedonian influence towards the coastal cities. Now though, a more concerted effort could be made with the other areas of the empire being more stable. This would see the establishment of two major colonies, east and west of the Chalcidides, that would be much more effective at protecting Athenian interests within the Chalcidides, as well as the coastlines running east and west. The locations of these colonies would also see that Athens was in a much better position to keep the region better supplied by sea, and if the threat warranted, Athens could deploy force to deal with it. So I set out with this episode to show how Athens had now moved from overseeing a league to an empire. Perhaps the definition of empire can be debated, as it seems pretty clear that the policy of Pericles was not to unite and control the entire Greek world. It would appear that the Athenian Empire would form over time responding to the events from the end of the Persian invasions. The policy that would see the empire come about seemed to revolve around the initial vision of what the league was supposed to achieve. However, for the aims to be achieved, all its members would need to be united in how the League operated. As time went on, we saw there were many instances of members looking to leave when it suited them. This would see Athens, the most powerful member, take measures to see that the League would remain intact. This was done through a combination of enticement, coercion and force. The result being at this point where Athens had secured a large territorial area that was committed to the interests of the city. It provided a secure trade route into the Black Sea not only keeping the large population of Attica fed, but provided a backbone to Athens' security on the Greek mainland. It would also seem at this stage, Athens had somewhat removed the problem of overpopulation. Keeping its empire in check required a lot of manpower. The garrison colonies dotted all around the Aegean itself would have seen many military-aged men deployed outside the city, not to mention the constant establishment of other colonies along the edges of the empire. We even find that Athens had to resort to enticing and recruiting non-Athenians to be involved in these new founding colonies. Back at home, Athens was also now beginning to look the part of being the head of an empire. The buildings atop the Acropolis had been destroyed twice during the Persian invasion. We then saw not long after the treasury of the League was moved from Delos to Athens, Pericles had saw that work would be started on beautifying the city. This had been a controversial move since he would use funds from the treasury but would defend his position when being attacked by the politician Thucydides. It would be towards the end of the 430s when work on the Parthenon would be completed, this being the ruins that still stand to this day and that have become the most recognisable image of ancient Athens. Athens was now as secure as it had ever been. Pericles, since coming to power, had spent the last two decades helping drive the policy forward that led to this. It was not without its dangers, as Pericles would learn from. Probably the largest of these was the dangers tied up with expanding when other threats existed on its borders. It would be in a speech Pericles would give on the eve of the Peloponnesian War where we find this lesson highlighted. I have many other reasons to hope for a favourable outcome. If you can consent not to combine schemes of fresh conquest with the conduct of war, 
and will abstain from willfully involving yourselves in other dangers. Indeed, I am more afraid of our own blunders than of the enemy's devices. It is the events leading up to this Peloponnesian War that we will now be turning to in the series. As we will see, this will not be some dramatic event in Athens or Sparta that would see these two great Greek powers go to war against each other and drag the rest of the Greek world along. It would, like many other great conflicts, be started in far off places, seemingly unimportant when viewed alongside the conflict that would erupt. Thank you everyone for your continued support and a big shout out to all those who have found some value in the series and have been supporting it on Patreon and other various ways. Your contribution has truly helped me grow the series. If you have also found some value in the show and wish to support the series, you can head to www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the support the series button where you can discover many ways to extend your support to helping the series grow. Be sure to stay connected and updated on what's happening in the series and join me over on Facebook or Instagram at Casting Through Ancient Greece or on Twitter at Casting Greece. And be sure to subscribe to the series over at the Casting Through Ancient Greece website. Once again everyone, thanks for the support and I hope you look forward to the next episode. Episode 68, The Powder Keg. <laughs>